Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be getting started in about an, a minute or so. It's just about two o'clock, so we'll get started right at two. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on digital testing techniques for WCAG compliance. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Please use the chat box in Zoom for any questions you're having on getting connected, audio issues, or similar related around the webinar. Priya is monitoring the chat during the webinar. Please use the Q&A section for questions you'd like us to answer at the, on the content of the webinar, as we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. My name is David Herr. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Strategic Alliances here at Common Look. I'd like to introduce Kim Testa, Executive Vice President at the Bureau of Internet Accessibility, as we will be your speakers today. So with introductions out of the way, let's get started with our presentation. So today we're going to talk about you know, testing techniques for WCAG compliance. And so when we talk about testing techniques for compliance, you know, why are we doing this? And ultimately, we're doing this so that um, content, digital content, works with assistive technology. And there's many types of assistive technology. We tend to think of it as being screen readers or, or similar, just, you know, large displays and things like that. Um, but there's a lot of other assistive technologies that are out there, and they continue to be um, developed and advanced. Um, the beauty of testing against standards like WCAG is we don't have to develop assistive technology compliant content for each individual technology. So in other words, if you create it for WCAG 2.0 AA or 2.1 AA, um, screen readers and refreshable braille displays and magnifiers and other tools are going to work with that, that, that code, that, those documents, those website resources, because you've met the standard and the tools are using standards-based compliance. So that's the beauty of all of this. So with that, we're going to start, um, and Kim's going to start talking about website accessibility testing. Thanks, Dave. Um, as we start to go through this, keep in mind that um, what we're going to review applies to um, the digital auditing of websites, web-based applications, and um, mobile applications. Um, and testing um, should include um, and when I say testing, I'm, I'm talking more auditing, which there are two components for that. One is manual testing, which is done with the screen readers, keyboards, and different devices, and automated testing, which is used to quickly scan websites um, for certain errors. The testing needs to be in accordance with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG 2.1 Level A and AA, with ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and other specifications, specifications based on the content type and device, etc. But how do we actually conduct testing to reliably and consistently assess accessibility? What are we looking for? Next. Um, as I had mentioned, there are two components and we're going to talk about manual testing first and manual test testing um, that's performed by, by subject matter experts and individuals with disabilities using assistive technologies to identify any accessibility barriers. And that's done with screen readers, keyboards, visual testing to eliminate, uh, evaluate elements such as color contrast, desktop testing, and mobile testing. 
and testing um, may be done on web pages and it should be also any custom use cases. Some companies today are making the unfortunate decision to skip manual evaluations, believing that automated scans, widgets, and overlays are enough on their own. And they're finding out the hard way that exactly why manual testing from experts who understand how to interpret and apply accessibility best practices is required. And why is that? It's because people, people of all abilities are using websites, not machines, not algorithms, but people. It's people that are using these websites and identifying and beginning to address the accessibility issues people may face requires people to do the testing. Hopefully this becomes more evident um, as we look at some of the key issues that a tester should look for. On another note, before we jump in any further, while we're talking specifically about website testing, as I had mentioned earlier, most of what we're going to review can be applied to digital content, all digital content. Whether it lives on a kiosk, a native app or elsewhere, human testers, including individuals with disabilities should be immersed in the use and involved in all of their testing. When we um, talk about manual testing as well, um, we, we're going to look at it today based, based on the impact of different disabilities. So for digital, visual disabilities, what are we looking for? We need to make sure that text alternatives for images, controls, and other content is all in place. That no loss of information or function when text, images, or pages are resized. It needs to, we need to make sure predictable and consistent navigation mechanisms and controls are all in place and that text or audio alter alternatives are um, for all content, for all video content. Next. Also for visual, you, you have, we have to make sure a sufficient color contrast ratios are there. Ability to resize, ability to customize the content um, is not necessarily prevented. And full keyboard navigation and operation, including visual focus um, indication. Most folks think that accessibility is for, well, only for people who are blind. Certainly websites do need to work for them and any assistive technology that they may use, such as a screen reader, um, and which will help them identify features like alt text, navigation, heading, structure, proper labeling, full keyboard accessibility are all critical to ensuring the information can be found, understood, and interacted with. But you may have also noticed checkpoints on this list that seem to require sight such as no loss of information when content is resized, color contrast minimums, keyboard focus indication to let a keyboard user know what element they're focused on. And that's because vision is not as simple as people who can see and people who can't. For example, how many of you, if you're like me, may have lost your glasses today and might need to zoom uh, your screen to make the text a little bit larger? Also, how many have some form of color blindness, low vision or low contrast? On many websites, color contrast is critical for reading and identifying all information. This is why manual testers and cited subject matter experts need to review the content to make sure it works for you as well as someone that is actually blind using a screen reader. Next. Hearing disabilities. What are we looking for here? Um, captions or transcripts with audio content, including multimedia like videos. Visible and functional caption and volume control. Um, you have to make sure that voice is not the only interaction or control method and that sound is not the only way or alerts um, are conveyed. Now, imagine for a moment you're using a live chat to resolve a customer service issue. 
And a chime alert is the only indicator that lets you know that after you've waited 25 minutes, um, that an agent is now available to help you. If you have strong hearing and you've got the volume turned on loud enough or you're not on a train <laughs> or in an office with the sound turned off so that it doesn't distract others around you, then yeah, maybe that chime alert may be enough. But if you're deaf, or hard of hearing, or in that moment, you can't use sound, so you have the sound turned off, that chime becomes a lot less helpful. To supplement something like that, a visual cue on screen is necessary. Now, that's one example, but the point applies to all web content. Any sound that has any significance or meaning needs an alternative so that people who can't hear it or can't hear it well enough can receive that same exact information. That's the same principle that applies to videos and captions, which are probably the most well-known accessibility feature for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. The auditory needs to be supplemented with visual. As well, just a little a side note here, um, a lot of videos um, on platforms like social media and on Facebook a lot of those videos are now watched with the sound turned off. And that, that number is about 80% of the users have that turned off. So with things like that, captioning, transcripts, visual cues are an absolute must for any of your users. The next one we're going to cover is cognitive learning and neurological disabilities. And, and what do we look for from them? Um, we, you need to make sure if everything is predictable and, cons and has that consistent navigation mechanisms and controls in place. Layouts and navigation are not unnecessarily complex to use or to even be understood. Animations such as audio and moving, blinking or flicking, flickering content, that it can be paused or hidden and the ability to adapt a page designs and controls. Those are all things that need to be manually tested. And with cognitive learning and neurological disabilities represents a broad range of behavioral and neurological and sometimes even mental health conditions that may or may not affect the intelligence of a person. These disabilities can Im uh, impact how a person expresses or receives information in communication, their motor abilities, their vision, hearing, and their ability to understand and commute and uh, consume that information. So how can we test for this? Well, the accessibility needs for people with cognitive disabilities are admittedly not understood in a way that is broadly applied to web content at the same level as other disabilities, like blindness, for example. To combat this, there are task forces in place, both at the W3C, who publishes the uh, guidelines, and at a number of outside independent agencies who are all working to put stricter testing requirements in place to be more inclusive um, and accessible in this space. But as the results of that ongoing work continue to become available, there are existing requirements in place under WCAG 2.1 level AAA to help account for quite a bit of this and manual testing to identify and remove barriers like flashing, strobing content and automatically playing content like videos and music help to keep content safe and free of unnecessary points of distractions. Now you may ask yourself, can web content really be physically unsafe? Um, and it sure can. If you have epilepsy or photosensitive seizure conditions um, and that website's creators don't take all of this into account. And this is where subject matter experts are trained to find these kinds of issues that others may not even notice. Physical disabilities. Full keyboard navigation and operational operations, including visual focus indication. You have to make sure enough time to read content responsible to the prompts or provide in user input. Accessible and equivalent text alternatives and labels for images and controls, predictable and consistent navigation mechanisms and controls. 
one of the reasons keyboard testing is so critical um, and so valuable in manual testing is that, yes, it helps to make sure that website is fully keyboard accessible and an absolute must for many users who use the keyboard in place of a mouse. But it also helps lay the framework for usability of other assistive technologies that may not specifically be used in testing, like switches, for example. When things work with a the keyboard, they tend to work with other assistive technologies, or rather they tend to at least be reachable and or findable with other assistive technologies. And in fact, many manual accessibility testers will start out with their testing. They'll start out by poking around with your keyboard before they actually take that deep dive into their testing. And why do they do this? Because it gives them a pretty quick understanding of what, what might be what they might be in for in regards to what they're going to find. For example, they'll know that if they can't get some important content with a keyboard or they can't use their keyboard to open a menu, that content already is not available to the keyboard users and probably it's not going to be available for any of the other assistive technologies. Next. Uh, speech disabilities. Um, there are only two, two points on this page. There are only two bullets. Um, one is voice is not the only interaction and or control. Voice-based communications is not only, it's not the only way to communicate and contact. And there are only two bullets on this slide. Um, and there could be a lot more, but the theme and the main takeaway would all be the same. Speech disabilities refer to any difficulty audibly speaking in a way that is identifiable and understandable to others. Therefore, don't and you shouldn't build products and processes that require speech detection or speech recognition. Uh, there, are, there are many, many reasons for um, reasons a person may be unable or may want to choose not to speak. So you want to make sure to give these individuals control over their web experience by giving them multiple options. So we just reviewed um, manual testing and some of the things that we look for and the reasons that are all behind it and why we do that. Now we're going to review automated. So as in the beginning, there are two components, automated and manual testing. For automated testing, um, it is a fast, it's powerful and it is sophisticated, but it is not a replacement for manual testing. <laughs> Excuse me. What it does, it's going to quickly scan a website and identify some errors. It's great for casting that wide net, catching some certain types of violations. It's an important part of accessibility testing strategy, but it cannot be used as a replacement for manual audit and cannot be used as the only way to show compliance. Also, an automated scan has the ability to catch about 20 to 25% of any accessibility issues. Next. So here, what we're looking at is an example, and this is for an example of automated testing. Um, an automated scan can determine if there's an image and if that image has alternative text associated with it. However, it can't detect if it's proper alternative text. So here we have three images, they're all the same images of a mop on the floor. And underneath in each image, as if it, an automated scan went through it, it will detect that yes, it, it will pass because it has alternative text associated with it. However, two of them, one of them says their alternative text is cute baby, the second is T-Rex, and the third says mop. So that's one thing and the reason why it, automated testing is a company to manual so that you can go in and assure that it does have um, the proper alternative text. So with all that being said, Automated accessibility testing misses many violations. It identifies a number of false violations, which are instances where it thinks a rule has been broken, but usability isn't actually impacted. And it isn't a substitute for manual testing, so why on earth would we even use it? 
um, automated scanning actually does add quite a bit of value to accessibility testers and to client companies. And three reasons. Number one, it's fast. It's really fast. And on a website that has hundreds or even thousands of pages, manual accessibility testing on each page probably isn't in the cards and it would be extremely expensive to manually test every page. Two, automated scans um, are great for benchmarking and monitoring. So when automated scans are implemented as part of your ongoing monitoring plan, they can provide an effective and efficient way of, of knowing if something has affected the accessibility of your website. A lot of times though, a subject matter expert would have to go in and review the automated scans and results with you. But then again, there may be thousands of pages. So at the, in that point, it's really going to act as a heads up and be really helpful on where you stand. And three, there are some types of issues that it actually does a really nice job of catching. For example, if a developer forgot to put um, a title in the metadata or missed identifying the language of the page in the HTML, an automated scan can actually do a really good job of bringing that to your attention. So in conclusion, with ideally, um, a website should be sized up and scoped out to determine the absolute most effective way to test web pages in custom use case cases which are the most important activities someone actually comes to a website to perform, all of which should be built into your um, testing plan, your action plan. But in general, the principles, I'm hoping the principles and tactics that we covered here today for your website um, will help you uh, and guide you through this. Excellent. So now we're going to um, talk about PDF testing. and. The, the, you're probably wondering if we're talking about website testing, why are we talking about PDF testing? And the, the reason is, is that PDFs tend to be a significant portion of the total web content in many websites. Um, and it's PDFs are a little unique. Um, they are still tested against the same standards as HTML for your website. Um, so WCAG or 2.0 or 2.1. Um, and then there's some more specific to PDF standards like PDF UA. Um, some of the aspects of, that make PDF unique compared to HTML is you know, PDFs are static. They're designed to be downloaded. They can be emailed. They can be transferred around. They keep their format the entire time. So there's some unique things that need to be done in a PDF that are, are unique compared to HTML. And that's, those are the things we're going to address as we talk about PDF accessibility. So first of all, the, the layers and levels of PDF accessibility, it's a little bit confusing. Um, with web content, typically, you know, there, there's one way to do it. And you, know, you can test your website and, and discover that you have many issues, but then you go through the code and you fix it and it either passes or it fails. Um, and with PDFs, it's the same thing, but there's a lot of confusion around you know, tagging and, and what, what does it mean and, and, and how, how deep do I have to go and what's compliant and what's not compliant. Um, so starting out with a PDF that's not tagged. So you've created a PDF, you created it on a copier, or it was created out of a, out of a software tool that generated the PDF. If it's not tagged, um, it is generally considered not accessible at all. Now, if, if it's pure text and no, no formatting or anything, and it's just a block of text, a screen reader like JAWS may be able to interpret it and attempt to read it, and it may, may work OK. But any normal document that has navigation, that has a table of contents, that has columns or images or anything without tagging is by default not accessible and does not meet the WCAG standard. Um, so how do you tag a PDF? Well, the typical way that people tag a PDF is you can go into Adobe Acrobat as the editing tool, and there's some additional, there's some other tools available now, I believe Foxit and some others that allow you to tag PDFs. So you go into the tool and you say add accessibility tags. And what the tool attempts to do is it auto tags the document by identifying how the document is structured and saying, I think these are heading levels, I think these are paragraphs. So it will attempt to tag the document in that manner. 
from a risk, you know, legal liability, is it accessible or is it not accessible? Merely adding tags is not, does not make the document accessible. So you're still at much more legal risk if all you're doing is just adding tags by default out of Acrobat and then not touching it or using Chrome or any other tool to generate the PDF. Um, the, the next layer is in what I would call intelligent tagging, um, where you're using a lot more technology and sophistication to do the automated tagging. Um, we have a tool called Common Look AI that uses um, basically already remediated sample documents to generate a model um, so the documents that have a similar format are then auto tagged based on the structure of the, the samples that were fed to the system. So there's, there's more sophisticated auto tagging and then there's less sophisticated auto tagging. Um, again, that takes you to a higher level of you know, accessibility, but it's not 100%. And then finally, you have documents that are remediated and verified manually that are fully compliant. Um, and there's also tools that can generate fully compliant documents that are template based. So there's ways to generate fully compliant documents either through some, some tools or through the manual checks and balances. But we'll talk about now what's involved in creating compliant documents. When we say compliant, we're saying standards compliant. So a document is certified as WCAG 2.1 AA compliant and meets all the checkpoints and requirements. So here's eight steps to PDF accessibility. And this isn't the be all end all, but it's covering a lot of the basics. Um, so the very first thing is tagging. The PDF has to have the accessibility tags added to the document. And so if you're not familiar with accessibility tags, Adobe added to the PDF file format a while back. There's the physical view of the document where they added a tag view to the document. And what the tag view is, is it's basically a, a line by line description of the document. And that's what a screen reader uses when it, when it, when it reads a PDF document or if it's a, a braille display when it displays the document in braille. Um, so what it does is that tag tree describes all the content in the document. So the, the title of the document, the heading levels of the document, what content is a paragraph, is it two paragraphs side by side? Is it an image? And then the alt text behind that image, um, tables and, and, and um, lists and things like that. So the document is described using this tag tree. And the tag tree contains what it is and then what the content is. And that's what's read by a screen reader or other assistive technologies. So that's the document has to be tagged. It has to be tagged correctly. It has to be tagged in the correct order so that the reading order of the document matches the visual display. Many times tools that, that tag documents, like when you go to Acrobat and you say add accessibility tags, it, it normally has lots of problems with the reading order that, you know, columns may be reversed or, or heading levels may be bounced around. And those are all the things that have to be fixed in the tag tree to match the physical document. <clears throat> the next thing you need to make sure you have is metadata. Metadata describing the author and the title of the document. They're, they're in the WCAG standards and in the PDF UA standards, there's a requirement for metadata that, again, a screen reader is going to read and announce so that people know, is this a document I want to download and read? Color. And it's, it's both the use of color and it's that color contrast thing that we talked about. So you know, much of these, as you read, are going to match the things that we had to deal with on HTML. Um, but they're handled differently within a PDF document versus HTML. The alt text descriptions, again, matching what we have to do in HTML. We need an, an accurate alt text description of an image that's in a document. And, and there's rules because PDFs are a little bit different. So if the document has, um, let's say, an image or a background image, a watermark or something, um, you can artifact that, so basically it's ignored by a screen reader because if it has, if it doesn't convey any value or any information, it's really just used for decoration. Um, you can block that out, so the person using the screen reader isn't going to be confused hearing about now, you know, a, a waterfall background or something on a document that has nothing to do with what the content's really about. It was more for decoration. Um, so all text descriptions and artifacting, facting content that is not conveying information. Lists need to be properly tagged. Lists can be really 
difficult to, to hear on a screen reader or an assistive technology, um, and they are often tagged incorrectly, so they need to be fixed. So the list is described and displayed, and, and, and you can hear it properly. Tables, same thing. Tables are notorious for having lots of accessibility issues. Um, it, you need to be able to tab through a table and understand the content. It needs to read the row header and the row column and then the content within the cell so that it makes sense. So that when you're look, hearing the table being read to you, you can understand where you're at in it and what you're, what you're hearing. Um, there's other things that need to be fixed in the tagging um, that are kind of the cleanup of the document. And then once you've done all of that, you then need to test it. You need to test it against the standards. Um, we have a process that we use to, to enable this to happen. Um, we also have a free tool called Common Look PDF Validator that will do this testing. And we'll talk more about testing in a little bit. Um, but you want a tool that's going to walk you through the process and go and make you do those manual verifications. So somebody physically looking at the alt text and saying, yes, that is the accurate description of that document, much like Kim talked about earlier, where you can have three different alt text descriptions, but none of them were a mop, except for the one that said it was a mop. So let's talk about manual testing tools. Um, a lot of people will use Adobe Acrobat for testing PDF documents. Um, it is pretty much was the default tool for doing it until recently when there's some additional tools that now can edit PDF. So most people are using Acrobat. Um, and, you know, lots of times we'll see people say, well, we, we, we tested the document, we tagged it in Acrobat, and it passed the Adobe Accessibility Checker, so the document is completely accessible. And, and the problem with that is the Adobe tool, um, despite what they say, doesn't certify the documents to a particular standard. Um, you can certainly create with CAG 2.0 or 2.1 AA or even PDF UA compliant documents using Acrobat, but you're only going to be doing it if you're skilled at doing remediation and you understand the things that Adobe is not showing you in the accessibility checker. So you, you can't really use this tool as how you're going to do your final testing and be certain that it's accessible. There's other tools that you're probably going to want to take a look at that are, and dig a little bit deeper. Um, there's a tool called PAC3. It's a free tool that tests against PDF UA. Um, and it can help you know, fine tune and find additional accessibility issues that need to be fixed within the document. Um, the only issue with the PAC tool is it doesn't require manual checks. So it just looks for the presence of alt text, for example. And if it does see alt text, it's going to say, it's going to pass it and say, there was alt text. Now, you would want to manually check that that alt text is correct before you would finalize the document. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Common Look, we have a tool called PDF Validator that's a free tool as well. And, and our tool will test against WCAG 2.0, 2.1, PDF UA, HHS, um, and the ISO 32000 standard for PDFs. Um, and the nice thing about our tool is it does manually have the person running the test um, verify those manual checks. So, and in fact, you can even put your initials in and say you say you were the one that tested the document. So it's a great tool for after you've gone through the remediation process to finalize and make sure you didn't miss anything um, before you're done. So all these tools have learning curve, you know, they have their pros and cons. There's no perfect testing tool out there as Kim talked about for web testing. You know, you're not gonna find everything. That's why the manual checks are part of the process. And, um, Ideally, if your tool, when you're done, can generate some kind of a report, that's further evidence that you can show that you went through and did the proper testing in addition to your manual testing. So in addition to going through a tool like Acrobat or, or Common Look PDF or some other tool to do your remediation, um, another good manual testing process is to listen to the document or, or run it through some assistive technologies, which typically people will use some kind of a screen reader. And a lot of people, again, just like they'll use the Adobe accessibility checker to say they tested the document and it's fully accessible when perhaps it's not, um, Adobe has their read aloud tool that will read the document. And people will say, well, I listened to it with a screen reader. I used Adobe read aloud. Um, and there's some issues with that. So we wanted to point that out in, in this session. So, you know, the reason we're doing PDF 
tagging and then we're ensuring the tags work it is so that people using assistive technology um, are getting the full value out of the content. So it's the same whether you have site or whether you're using assistive technology to process and understand the document that you're reading. Um, so we're trying to make these documents 100% transparent to everyone. That's the process. Um, and it's not just people that are blind, people with cognitive disabilities, people that would prefer to listen to the content rather than um, you know, read it. And, you know, so there's other people that are using these documents that are tagged properly. And it's more and more technologies come out to take advantage of tags, um, the assistive technology tags. Um, we'll probably see this more and more in use. Um, so when you, I was talking about your options for testing, um, how, I, how am I going to test the document with assistive technology? Well, if you use Read Aloud, it is built into Acrobat, and you can, you know, it'll read the text within the document that's within in the window. Um, a much better option is to use an actual screen reader. Um, many of you are probably familiar with JAWS, and um, you can get that through, um, that's for purchase type product. Um, and NVDA is a screen reader that a lot of people use that is also a free tool, so that has that advantage. And then there's various screen readers that are built into various operating systems, voiceover, window eyes, things like that. So using those types of tools to actually analyze the documents that you've made accessible is a great way to learn if they're truly accessible or not, and it's part of a manual testing process. You know, just going back again to you know, using Adobe as your only way to test it, it's not a true screen reader. Um, and that's a big issue because basically the only way you can use Adobe Read Out Loud is you have to place the document in Acrobat into what they call reflow mode, which isn't the native format of the document. It tries to um, put the document into a, in a, into a form that will then be able to be read. So it's trying to stack the columns so it's one column wide and things like that. So it doesn't truly represent your document. It's representing the content in your document sort of reformatted so that it would work with their built-in text-to-speech tool. Um, so while it may read in Adobe Read Out Loud, it may not work properly in a screen reader. Um, so you can't use this as your only test. It, best practice is going to be to use an actual screen reader for any manual testing you're doing. Um, and if you have people with disabilities that are doing your testing for you, you know they're using a proper screen reader. So, so let's talk about scan documents, because scan documents are a huge problem. A lot of organizations have old content that goes back for a long period of time. Perhaps you're, you're required legally to keep documents on your website for seven years. So those documents that are five, six, seven years old, many of those are scanned. Many of those are... Um, you know, run off on a copier and then they're, they're put up on the web. You know, the problem with those documents is a scanned document is not accessible. And the reason it's not accessible is it's basically a picture of the document. Um, so a screen reader is not going to be able to read it and you can't really put in alt text for that picture um, of a document. It's too, it's too complex. It's too much. So and you couldn't read it, navigate it, do all the other things. So you have to do OCR. Um, you're going to have to take the document and run it through some OCR technology to extract the text out of the document. Um, so you stay, still have the, the image of the document, but you're going to now have in the tags tree all the content that's been pulled out of the document, and now that can be tagged properly. Um, and, and that way you can then search it and edit it and, and find content. I mean, the thing about making documents accessible is for you and I, we would look at a document. If you have site, you would you would open up a document and you would go to the table of contents and you might go to page 74 that has exactly what you're looking for. Well, without having the ability to navigate the document using a screen reader, um, somebody would have to start at the top of the document and start listening to the entire document before they got to page 74, which is what they were looking for. Um, so tagging documents so that they have navigation in them allows a screen reader user or assistive technology user to find the content they're looking for in the same way as somebody um, looking at the document. So that's the purpose of why we have to do this. So we OCR, extract the text, and then once the text has been extracted, um, we can now add the tags like we would do for any, any document, and now it's got the full capabilities. Um, just a couple mentions on OCR, though. It's not perfect. 
um, you certainly have to go back and, and do some checks, especially if the document is older and maybe it's a little crooked and some of the text didn't come through or maybe it was typed on a typewriter or God forbid something, <laughs> something worse that it's, it's you know, going to require manual verification. Somebody's going to have to go back and probably adjust what's been done in the OCR in, in the areas where there's errors. Um, but once you've done it, um, scan documents can be as accessible as regular PDF documents that are properly tagged. So let's talk about automation because there's more and more we're hearing about automation in, in remediation. And um, there are tools that can do remediation and can do automation to a degree. It doesn't eliminate the manual process, though. It doesn't eliminate a lot of things. So you know, what, what can automation do? It, it can check for tags. As we said before, a tag document either has tags or it doesn't have tags. So automation can check for tags. Um, it can look at heading levels and see that heading level one is first and then heading level two is second, not it starts with heading level three and, and that makes the navigation all confusing. It can look for alt text, but as we said before, it can't verify the accuracy of alt text. Um, it can look for use of color and, and, and identify, hey, there's color on the page. Is this the only way that information is being conveyed? Um, and it can look for tables and it can look for table headers and table columns and, and things like that. You know, there's things automation can't do. And, and one of those that's very important is the correct reading order. Um, so, you know, reading order has to be verified. When you look at a document, um, you know, you, you, you look at it and you start going left to right, top to down, top to bottom, down through a document. But that is typical difficult with a lot of the automated tools. So reading order typically has to be verified. Um, the same thing with content that's been artifacted. Um, is it accurate to have artifacted it? it? Maybe it does convey information. So through through automated tools, you know, that has to be verified. Um, lists typically have a lot of issues and so how they need to be tagged properly so they make sense. Um, so that has to be verified. We've talked about color contrast, metadata, and tables are typically things that automation struggles with. So our recommendation um, is to develop a, a, a multi-phase document accessibility plan, um, starting with looking at your systems, looking at your documents, and some way to audit how many files do I have? What's the data? When were they uploaded? Are they still relevant? How often are they accessed? So you really need to be able to inventory the scope and the scale of your document accessibility plan. Um, and then once you've done that, set priorities. So what's the most important? You know, in most cases, the most important is going to be the documents that, you know, are, are most accessed and are maybe the newest documents. And then maybe those, those scanned copier documents that were up on the web in 2012 Maybe they can be removed from your website because maybe they're no longer relevant. And rather than have inaccessible content on your website, they could probably just be removed because they're too old. You know, once you've identified the priorities, what you need to work on, you, then you're going to go back and fix the errors. You're going to go use remediation tools. You're going to use manual testing and, and you know, automated testing tools and manual testing processes to remediate your documents and make sure they're accessible. Um, and then you're really looking to be proactive and, and kind of plan this out. We often talk that accessibility is a process, not a project. And, and that's just so true. Um, you can't just go in, fix your website and be done with it because websites are dynamic and content is dynamic and documents are added to your website constantly. Your website's constantly being updated. So you have to build a program around accessibility that is ongoing. Training is critical. Um, PDF accessibility does require some skills. And so you need to train and expand and make sure that as, as people move on in the company that the people that, that are doing the work understand what they're doing and have the tools to do it. And then finally, you need to have a way to monitor and go back and just make sure that you've, you're staying in compliance and that there isn't some source of content that's inaccessible that's being put back on your website. Um, so this is a constant program. So this is the same sort of thing we're talking about. You know, analyze, remediate, repair. Um, you're going to do your reporting um, and your auditing, and then you're going to have your compliance that you're looking for. Um, and that's that's our goal.
So with that, we're going to go to questions here in a second. Um, I do see we have questions in the chat box. Um, I we did want to tell everybody about the next webinar that we're having on the 17th, um, Digital Accessibility Laws and How They're Applicable. Um, we have Jim Rockney from Reed Smith, um, who's going to be bringing some really valuable information on the legal implications of accessibility. Um, this is an attorney that's involved in, in lawsuits around digital accessibility. And so he can really answer the questions that a lot of people have about this and, and what the risks are and what's required for compliance. So that's going to be next week. Um, feel free to sign up on our websites if you would like to attend this webinar. And with that, we're going to go to questions. So first question, if we provide an audio file for a board meeting, do we need to provide a full transcript as well? Do the meeting minutes cover this if they're not word for word? Um, I would say yes. Uh, if you have an audio file, um, that is the entire meeting that has been recorded. Someone um, that is deaf or hard of hearing may not, obviously won't be able to listen to that. So if you provide just the minutes, it's not going to give them the full extent of what that meeting was all about and what took, uh, actually what took place during the meeting. So I would say, yes, you probably should have a full transcript. And then the next question is, if we create a report that includes images for visual interest, but they are not key to the information, is it better to add alt text or label them as artifacts? Is this for a PDF or is this on a web? Um, Dave, do you want to take that? I, I think it's for yeah, a report based. Yeah, it doesn't specify, so we'll, we'll assume it's documents, but I guess it could be the same thing for web. The um, If it's visual interest, but if it doesn't convey information that's important to the reader or, you know, of whatever the content is, then labeling it as artifacts takes it out of the way because it's more of a distraction. You know, I mean, so a visual interest, but it's not pertinent to what the conversation is that the document's trying, the information the document's trying to convey. So we would recommend you, you artifact it if it is not, not of any kind of importance to, to what they're trying to get out of the document. And there's lots of, lots of examples of that um, where somebody will put something on around the page or, you know, a footer or something, but it has nothing to do with the document itself. So for the, in those cases, you can artifact that information. Um, the next question said, do you have any tips for software to help remediate OCR before tagging? Um, I specifically, I mean, there's some tools that, that we've used for cleaning up OCR, um, and I can check with our technical team um, and can give you some advice as to what's out there that's available. It's nothing we sell, but it's, it's tools that are, that are good for cleaning up OCR work. Um, there's a number of them that are out there. Um, you, get, you can get our contact information at the next screen, and I'll roll to that now. Um, if you look at, you can email me, and I'd be happy to send you some information on what, what people that are doing remediation you know, on our company are using for cleaning up OCR. Uh, and then the next question, question is, what is automation, a specific tool of software? Um, in the case of automation on the PDF side, um, there's lots of tools that will um, do either auto tagging or generate tagged PDF content. So it is software. Um, it can be tools that are designed to take existing PDF documents and you run them through this tool to fix them. Or it can be tools that, that generate the tagged PDF document like out of a database. So let's say like an invoicing system where it's pulling out all the customer names and then all the products that they purchased and other information specific to this invoice. And then an invoice is generated. And now that's going to be emailed to all of our clients. Well, that it's emailed as a PDF. Um, you want that PDF to be you know, generated by this automated system as an accessible document. So that's what that's the kind of automation that we're talking about. Um, and in regards to website automation or automatic um, scanning, it is a it's like an application. So a software 
that um, will go through, you know, spiders your site and test it against all of the WCAG um, guidelines. And the next question said, any specifics to fillable PDF? Um, yes, forms are a huge issue in, in the document accessibility side. Um, you know, a, a, by definition, a print to fill form is inaccessible. Um, it's basically designed to be a document that that you know, if it's tagged properly, you could you could read it, um, but then you're you're requiring the, the person to fill it or to print it and then fill it out. So if they're using assistive technology, they're not going to be able to fill it out. So a fillable PDF document is a PDF that can be filled out using a screen reader because you can tab through the form and you can type in the information in the form live online and then complete the document online. Um, and it works with a screen reader because it's been properly tagged um, to, to allow you to do so. so. So anytime you have a form that's in, in PDF on your website, it does need to be fillable to be accessible. And those forms um, require um, a, a greater skill, level of skill from a remediation standpoint to do it properly. But PDF forms can be completely accessible when they're done correctly. Um, the next question asked me to flip back to the last slide briefly, but I'm not sure um, what slide to go back to. Um, you can ask me that in the answer box and I can go back to that slide. Um, question on, does Common Look Tools work with Adobe InDesign? Um, and the answer to that question is not directly with Adobe InDesign. Um, you know, InDesign will, will generate tag PDF, um, but typically depending on, on how you've structured it within Adobe InDesign, you may have to do manual remediation when you're done. Um, our tools would obviously allow you to manually remediate a document generated from InDesign um, once, once it's it's outputted as a PDF, um, but we don't have anything that's a plugin directly to InDesign, but we do have a lot of recommendations on um, how to work with InDesign to generate a more accessible content. So we can certainly help you with that. Next question is, our library is conducting an accessibility audit. Is manual testing something we can do on our own using an accessibility tool or is it, should it only be done by a professional? Uh, that's a great question. The, um, with any digital accessibility audit for you, as you, you're doing for your library, there's two components that are absolutely needed, manual testing and um, automated testing as well. The manual testing absolutely should be done by a professional. So, and there are two for, when we're doing an audit, you know, we do uh, two passes. So we manually test everything twice. So first round of testing is done by an individual with disabilities or, or blind tester going in and testing. And then the second round testing is done by um, a cited subject matter expert who retests everything that was originally tested by that first round tester um, to make sure that there are all these checks and balances in place. Also, manual testing should be done by someone who is unbiased and independent of your site. And what that means is that it needs to be done by someone who is not going to remediate the code or build it or touch it in any way except for auditing it. Um, so yes, to answer your question directly, yes, it definitely should be done by a professional. The next question says, what tool would you recommend to create video captions or transcripts to a site? Um, so there are some, like for example, uh, YouTube has, the, they can create the captions. Um, but even if you are using a tool to get it started or something that's going to do some automatic stuff for you, it's extremely important that it is reviewed by um, some, uh, someone that knows and understands what that content should be to make sure that it's done correct. Many, many times when you're using any automated product for that, they, um, they, it, it can be, um, what is put into text can be different from what is actually being told or spoken to. So for example, take an online class where a professor or someone is, is teaching something 
um, the video, the automated th the automated tool may find something or say something and the transcript would be wrong. Um, and that's why it's always very, very important to have that human element in there looking at it and testing it, making sure that it's correct. Next question says, what is the best practice for a video that is straight text to have it available in audio, a separate audio file under the video or embedding it within the video? Um, I would say both uh, because it would, um, different individuals have different abilities. Uh, some will learn more by reading it um, instead of just the audio. So I would say both. So it should be under the file and also embedded in it. And then the next question is, Thanks. Do you have any suggestions for who to contact regarding manual testing? Yep, that would be me <laughs> for the for your website and app, web applications and native applic uh, native um, mobile applications. Uh, that's my direct email and my direct line for websites. And then Dave's information is there for manual testing of PDFs. All right. So I think we got. Or thank you. So thank you, everybody. That's great to see. So it looks like we've answered all the questions. So let's go on. So just um, want to thank everybody again today for your time and for listening to our webinar. Um, this will be captioned. And um, we will have that recorded caption available on our website. And we'll send you an email link to that once that's available. Um, if you look on our website, you'll see that there's a whole series of future webinars that are coming up. So if there's something of interest is, is there, please feel free to sign up for it. Um, and again, that one next week um, where we have Jim Rockney, I think will be of interest to a lot of organizations. So that's well, well worth attending if you have the time available. So again, wanna thank everybody, stay safe and um, we will talk soon in the future. Thanks everybody, take care. Bye-bye.